Last time we proved Stein's lemma, which is the remarkable statement that the Gaussian integration by parts formula actually uniquely specifies the standard normal distribution. And better yet, we used the same idea to show that that Gaussian integration by parts term as a difference controls the Wasserstein distance between any distribution and the Gaussian distribution. We're going to use that method today to prove a quantitative version of the central limit theorem. Let's be precise. For any random variable w, if z is a standard normal random variable, then what we have from Stein's lemma is that the Wasserstein distance between w and z is bounded by the supremum of this term here, the expected value of f prime of w minus w f of w in absolute value, where the supremum is taken over all real valued functions on the real line that are bounded by two, have derivative bounded by square root of two over pi, and second derivative bounded by two. Stein's clever idea was to show that this is true by writing the Wasserstein distance, which is a supremum over all lip one functions h of the expected value of h of w minus h of z, and then writing that difference, h of w minus h of z, in this form for some function f. That sets up an ordinary differential equation for f, which can be solved and has a unique bounded solution, which also satisfies these bounds on its derivatives. Now we're going to apply this to a random variable w, which is a standardized sum of iid variables. And let's actually normalize them from the start. So we'll take a sequence xn of iid random variables, which are centered and variance one. We're also going to assume that they are L3, not just L2. In fact, we'll see that the L3 norm is what controls the Wasserstein distance in this case. We'll now calculate each of these two in turn, starting with this one. The expected value of wf of w just expands. We're expanding w as one over square root of n times the sum of the xj's. And now here's the key idea that works in this proof and in many other Stein proofs. We want to replace w with w with one of the terms removed. That is, I'd like to sum up x1 plus x2 plus x4 plus x5 up to xn. Removing x3 is useful because the resulting sum of all the terms except for x3 is independent from x3. So that is, for each j, we'll define wj to be w minus one over root n xj, which is the same thing as one over root n times the sum of all of the terms except for xj. And by the grouping lemma and the independence assumption from the start, we have that wj and xj are independent random variables. Now therefore, f of wj is independent from xj, and we're assuming that f is a bounded function. So f of wj is certainly L1, xj is L3 and therefore L1, and so we know that this product of two independent random variables has expected value that factors. But we centered the xj's from the start, and so that's just zero. Now, that's not what we need, of course. We need the expected value of xj times f of w, not f of wj, but w and wj differ by one over root n xj, which is small. So that certainly suggests we consider the difference here. The term that we want to sum is exactly equal to this expected value here, since the expected value of xj times f of wj is zero. And now we've expressed things in terms of a finite difference of the function f. So we're going to put our calculus hats on. f is a differentiable function, and so for two real numbers w and x, f of w minus f at x is approximately the derivative f prime at x times w minus x. In fact, we can be exactly precise about that difference using Taylor's theorem exactly the same way we did when we proved the standard central limit theorem without a quantitative bound using characteristic functions. We know that this difference, f of w minus f at x, is equal to the next term in the Taylor expansion, w minus x times f prime at x, plus an error term, which has the form one half w minus x squared 
times f double prime at some point c. That point c can be chosen to be in between x and w, but that's not gonna matter to us here. Great, so that means that f of w minus f at x minus this term is quadratic in the difference, w minus x. In this case, w minus x, wj, is one over the square root of n times xj. So squaring it, we're gonna get something even smaller. That's what we'd like to do. Therefore, we'd like to write this in terms of that difference, but of course we have to add back in the second term to get an equality. And now we'll therefore break this up into two terms. For the first term, we've just shown from Taylor's theorem that this difference here is equal to this expected value, where Cj is now a random variable in between W and Wj, if we like, that's not gonna matter because f double prime is a bounded function and that's all we'll need. Now, as we noted, w minus wj is equal to one over root n xj. And so squaring that, this first term is one over two n times the expected value of, we have xj and an xj squared, so there's an xj cubed times f double prime at cj. For the second term, we also use the fact that w minus wj is one over root n xj, and so that means that this term is equal to one over root n times the expected value of xj squared f prime at wj. Now, f prime in Stein's method is a bounded function, and so this is an L1 function. x is L3, therefore L2, and so x squared is L1, and so again we have that this expected value of a product factors since xj and wj are independent. So that's equal to this product here, and we normalize things so that xj squared had variance one, so that's one. And so altogether, we get that this term that we're summing is equal to this plus one over root n expected value of f prime of wj. Now the first Stein term expected value of wf of w is one over root n times the sum of these. And so altogether that gives us this. And let's just combine the powers of n here. We have a one over root n from the whole sum and a one over two n in the first term. And so altogether that's one over two n to the three halves. For the second term, we'll combine the one over root n's to get a one over n. Now remember, the Stein term we need to compute is the difference of this and this. And so now we need to compute this guy here. But notice that already in here, we have something that looks similar. We have expected value of f prime at wj. And so we should compare that to f prime of w. We'll do exactly the same thing we did in the previous slide. This time we'll apply Taylor's theorem to first order to the function f prime, which is differentiable because f double prime is bounded by two in absolute value. And so this is going to equal the second order term f double prime at some point eta times the difference. Eta is a random variable in between wj and w. wj minus w is equal to minus one over root n times xj. And that gives us a nice way to compare this term here to this term here, because if we take the difference of those two and multiply and divide by n over here so that we can move this inside the sum, we get that that difference is equal to one over n times the sum of the difference here in expected value. But using what we just calculated about that thing we're taking the expected value of, that's equal to this sum here. And so rearranging that says that this quantity here that we're actually interested in for Stein's lemma is equal to this plus
this term here. Notice that in both of the terms we have an overall size of n to the 3 halves in the denominator, which is very promising. So if we now combine these two and subtract this from this, we'll see that these two terms cancel, and all we're left with is this minus this, which is what I've written right here. Now we take absolute values, we apply the triangle inequality, and move the expected values inside the integrals, and finally use the boundedness of the second derivative. These are two different points, cj and a to j, but all that matters is that whatever this is, it's less than or equal to 2, because we're souping over functions f whose second derivative is bounded by 2 in absolute value. And so all together, what we get is the following bound. Now that pretty much finishes the proof. What we have here is that the Stein term, which controls the Wasserstein distance between w and z, is bounded by 1 over n to the 2 thirds times 2 times a sum of terms here, which is of order n. In fact, we don't even need the identical distribution, so long as, say, the first and the third moments of the random variables x, j are uniformly bounded, then these will be of order n, and so we'll get a 1 over square root of n overall, which is the result we're trying to prove. Just for simplicity, let's stick to the identically distributed case. So that means that that average third moment is just the common third moment, and the average first moment is just the common first moment. And so what we've shown is that this quantity here is bounded by 1 over 2 root n times the soup of f double prime times the absolute third moment of the first random variable, plus 1 over root n times the supremum of f double prime times the absolute first moment. And so that proves our Wasserstein version of the Berriasin theorem. If we have iid random variables that are mean 0 and variance 1, and in L3, then the standardized sum has Wasserstein distance from a standard normal, which is of order 1 over root n, and the constant on top is largely controlled by the third absolute moment. And that's just because Stein's method tells us that this distance is the supremum over a class of functions f of this quantity that we've just bounded, where that supremum includes the condition that the supremum of f double prime is less than or equal to 2. Let me make one final comment here, which is that we can alternatively write this just in terms of the third moment, because the first moment is actually bounded by the third moment. And the reason for that is Hilder's inequality, which tells us that the first moment is less than or equal to the third root of the third moment times 1. And thanks to our assumption that the expected value of x squared is 1, we can apply Hilder's inequality once more, this time to x squared, taking a 3 halves power, to show that the expected value of x1 cubed is bigger than or equal to 1, which means that this is less than or equal to the expected value of x1 cubed. And so if we want a simpler statement, we can just bound this whole thing by 3 times the expected value of x1 cubed in absolute value divided by root n. We didn't cover Hilder's inequality in this class, and so if this is not something that means anything to you, you can go ahead and ignore it, since this is actually a tighter bound anyway. So we finally know the rate of convergence of the central limit theorem, at least in Wasserstein metric. It's 1 over square root of n, and it's not hard to show that that is the optimal possible rate in Wasserstein distance. Now, this does give us a bound for Kolmogorov distance, because as we proved two lectures ago, the Kolmogorov distance is bounded by 2 times the square root of the Wasserstein distance when comparing to a density with upper bound no bigger than 1, which the Gaussian is. And so this result here shows us that the Kolmogorov distance between our standardized sum and a standard normal is at worst a constant over the fourth root of n. Now that's not optimal. The right rate in Kolmogorov distance is also 1 over square root of n. Proving that using methods like what we've developed is possible, as we noted. In fact, the proof isn't so different from what we just did. 
But instead of using twice differentiable functions f, we'd have to use that function ft, which was the Stein solution, where the input function was the indicator function from minus infinity up to t, which is not even differentiable. It's a Lipschitz function with a kink at t. And so one needs a careful smoothing argument, smoothing that function over in the kink in order to apply Taylor's theorem, and then removing the smoothing procedure carefully in order to get the same result. And that's more work than we want to do. We will satisfy ourselves with the Wasserstein bound that we've proved. Now we saw in the proof that identical distribution wasn't necessary here at all. Just some kind of uniformity in the third moment is good enough. But actually Stein's theorem is much more powerful than just producing quantitative bounds for the Lyapunov central limit theorem. Next, we're going to see how to use Stein's method to analyze systems in which there are dependencies between lots of the random variables and still get Gaussian concentration in the limit.